What's up, freaks? This rip was brought to you by River. River's a Bitcoin company built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners the right way. There's no trusted third parties. They build all their infrastructure. They have free DCA because they know it's the best way to buy Bitcoin. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you want to mine Bitcoin, you want to send Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, you want to plug into their Lightning Network API. If you're a developer, they're building all these tools for you. They also encourage self-custody. Again, they're Bitcoiners. They want to provide an on-ramp for you and then teach you and encourage you to take control of your own Bitcoin. And they're doing this. It's a beautiful company. If you do hold Bitcoin on the exchange, you can know for sure, since they don't rely on any third parties, they don't lend your Bitcoin out, they don't speculate with your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is held in a multi-sig wallet with 100% reserves. Okay, so go to river.com slash TFTC, take advantage of the no fee DCA, you set up your dollar cost average, you don't pay any fees on those buys. If you're a developer, they have their Lightning Network Services API that you can build on, you can send over Lightning, you can mine, via river as well uh, you may have your exchange you may be comfortable with it but if you ha have you tried river yet it's a question you have to ask yourself if the answer is no go try it that's where all the bitcoiners are hanging out that's where i get my bitcoin as well river.com slash tftc thank you guys for listening if you're listening on youtube please subscribe set the notifications up as well we're going to be putting out a lot of content this year uh, if you want to subscribe to the podcast feed as well if you're not around your computer or not listening to youtube but you want to catch the podcast on the podcasting feeds subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and if you want to learn more about bitcoin i write a a newsletter almost daily during the week go to tftc.io subscribe on the website and you'll get pure signal on bitcoin macroeconomics geopolitics whatever tickles my fancy that day Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for supporting the show. If you can subscribe, rate, review, it goes a long way. We're trying to blow this up in 2023. Enjoy the rip. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Oh, we're live. Logan Ninja launched us. But yeah, Winnie and I were just <laughs> recording a podcast before hitting record, so we had to hit record because a lot of things are happening right now. We were just talking about censorship efforts <clears throat> in many countries. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Brazil. They were trying to find Google something like $200,000 an hour if they allowed. That was Telegram, I think. But yeah, they were trying to bring Google to heel as well and have them censor a bunch of stuff. And the, as I understand it, the whole censorship law debate in Brazil is pretty insane because there was a lot of pressure from people in the Supreme Court, people at the top level of their executive branch, uh, pressuring people in Congress to vote in favor of the bill. Um, they forced Google to censor, um, well, forced, I say, I'm sure Google was probably on board for at least some of the censorship since they love to do that, but um, uh, asked them to remove uh, advertising that was um, urging people to vote against the censorship bill and then had them uh, promote advertising in favor of it. I mean, that you know, it, it was really over the top, but despite that, it was rejected. And then you have Bolsonaro's uh, house being raided. Uh, after it fails. <laughs> I mean, that, that's pretty crazy. Uh, Brazil seems really insane right now. I'm glad I don't live there. Just... Yeah. I mean, they're using <laughs> the typical scapegoat of quote unquote propaganda to force Google and Telegram yeah. to do these things while they're right. But I think Brazil is, um, you know, it's the B and bricks. So they don't, they want the right guy who's down for the game to be in charge of the B and bricks right now. Right. Yeah. As we move to this like multipolar paradigm that we've talked about before that, you know, despite not, you know, being the other side of U.S. empire in, in the West, which is corrupt, too. Right. 
Mm-hmm. You know, Russia, China, and the BRICS countries are all just like the West on board for the SDGs and Agenda 2030 and all this stuff. And basically what that is about is the stuff that we're all supposedly against, like digital IDs, the CBDC, um, you know, turning the entire natural world into commodities and securitizing it and under the guise of protecting the environment and all this other insane stuff. All these countries, whether it's BRICS, or the the U.S. And, and Britain and the EU are all on board for this stuff. So, you know, they need a guy that's going to play by the rules and, and push Brazil into that into that world, right? And uh, Lula is the guy that they've chosen for that. And it's very possible some sort of deal was made when Lula was in prison previously. Yeah. So, like, yeah. we'll get you out of prison and get you back in power if you do X, Y, and Z. I'm sure that was probably part of the negotiations there. Yeah, he's like, all right. And, uh, just yeah. get me out of here. Give me the cushy job. Mm -hmm. But zooming out from Brazil, I mean, we were mentioning, it just seems like we're hitting a weird part of history where you have here in the United States, we have banks failing left and right. Uh, Yeah, but everything's fine and it's nothing like 08, even though it's clearly already worse than 08. Okay. In terms of the amount of like, you know, bank failures in terms of like what their assets were worth and stuff. I mean, yeah, 08 brought with it WAMU, which was the largest bank failure in U.S. history. Yeah, yeah. And 2023 has brought with it. I mean, after today, I imagine PacWest Corp is going to officially go under. So that'll be four of the top five banks that have failed in U.S. history will be in the last two months. Yeah, yeah. But hey, everything's fine, Marty. Um, the Fed's got it under control and we got to trust, uh, you know, Miss Janet and... <laughs> I'll be fine. Yeah, right? it, was, it was comical yesterday. Jerome Powell giving comments. The banking system is resilient and safe. And two hours later, the fourth largest bank failure in U.S. history. Uh, well, just like a week ago, wasn't Pac, past, uh, Pac West Corp saying like, oh, yeah, everything's fine and rosy. And we look at we're attracting all of these customers from Silicon Valley Bank now. And like yeah, everything's rosy. And then it's like, oh, actually, we've collapsed. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> does anybody want to buy And I'm us? sure. Yeah. Does JP Morgan want to buy us? Um, yeah. Well, that's a good segue into <laughs> what we originally, I mean, what we originally wanted to talk about is the rise of Jamie Dimon and a product of all these bank failures or a lot of them. Maybe JP Morgan won't get all of the banks that are currently failing. They'll get I'm, most of it. They've gotten a lot of it already. They got First Republic last week. Uh, and there's a lot of people saying they're probably going to get PacWest as well. And so it looks like, we discussed this on your podcast on Unlimited Hangout with Michael Krieger a couple months ago, and we basically laid this out. It seems like there is somewhat of a controlled demolition of the regional banking system so that they can all roll up yeah. into the systemically important banks, of which J.P. Morgan is the biggest. The two big to fail banks. Yeah. Yes. This reminds me of what happened under Nixon with agriculture. And the agriculture secretary, Earl Butts, it was called this policy called get big or get out. You know, either become a giant industrial farm or we'll destroy you. And that was basically the end of, you know, the the medium or small sized family farm in the United States. So this is sort of like that for the banking sector. And it's basically the logical conclusion of the too big to fail model. And I think what we're essentially seeing is the creation of two to three banks or one bank to rule them all at some point in the next, you know, 10 years, maybe less. Who knows? Depends on and what's going to go on, uh, you know, in the in the not so distant future. But ultimately, I think the goal is, yeah, to have the banking industry in a f- as few hands as possible. And those few hands are, you know, very down for CBDCs and all of this stuff. Because, well, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard two people are like, well, once the CBDCs are rolled out, they don't need the commercial private banks anymore. But if you actually are paying attention, there's a lot of stuff that's been coming out about how there's a, a distinct plan already on the books, essentially, to maintain the two tier banking system when the CBDC is rolled out and that basically, you know, the Fed will issue the CBDC tokens, but the wallets will be managed by the commercial banks. Like yeah, JP the com- Morgan. The commercial so. banks will be like the front end UI to the CBDC. <laughs> and that's a way socially yeah. for the Fed, the Treasury, whoever wants to bring the CBDC to send a social signal like, hey, we're somewhat separate. So um, yeah. it should be okay so, with you guys. So the added level of this, right, is like the Federal Reserve itself and how much of Fed policy is helping this goal of creating this 
increasingly small cartel of too big to fail mega banks. And the New York Fed, of course, is dominated largely by JP Morgan and Citigroup, both of which are in- intimately tied to Jamie Dimon, right? Um, and I mean, I don't know. Do you think those guys would, uh, you know, pull some strings on the Federal Reserve system they dominate to, you know, change monetary policy to further their uh, plans for control and, you know, capturing the whole sector and dominating it? I think uh, it's not that hard to figure out well, that's what may be going on here. But, you I know. I completely agree. And I mean, this goes back to one thing, <clears throat> the whole it's doublespeak. The federal reserve is not actually federal. It is a private institution owned by commercial banks. And I think that's, I think many more people are aware of it. Uh, over the last 10 years, they have become aware of the fact that the fed is a private institution, not actually a government institution, but most uh, of the U S populace is completely unaware and probably assumes that the federal reserve is part of the government and they don't recognize yeah. that it's actually a private institution. Yeah, like Federal owned. Express is part of the government. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the airline um, where they were running all the drugs in the 90s? Oh, what Southern Air Transport? No, the other, it had America in the name, I think. Um, oh, Air America. Air America, yeah. Was that was Southern Air Transport uh, previously when pre- it was owned by the CIA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, directly owned by the CIA. They were still owned by the CIA after. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a little more indirect Yeah, but at that go, point. Going back to J.P. Morgan, I mean, you wrote a piece at the end of March, and I believe another between now and then. It's a series, yeah, so there's two pieces out. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so I guess Jamie Dimon's being vaunted as this genius banker who's yeah. going to save yeah. the system. Okay. He'll, he'll yeah. gladly take all the bad <laughs> banks up to J.P. Morgan and make sure the financial He's system's so okay. He's so altruistic, Marty. He just he just wants to help everybody. He's America's banker. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's here to save us. But as you point out in your series, oh, there's a lot of weird uh, connections to people oh, we've totally talked about weird. in the past that have gotten him to the place that he's <laughs> yeah. at. Yeah, totally. It's nuts. I mean, I don't even know what to do. Like Bill Bill Gates just cares about your health. Jamie Dimon just cares about the little guy and his banking needs. And, you know, n- these guys don't care about power and control at all. You know, I mean, it's just so mental uh, to me that there's people that like still buy that in today's society. Um, yeah, please uh, get rid of your brain worms and start looking at, at reality, people, <laughs> because the, these guys did not claw their way to the top just to help the little guy. I mean, um, well, at, where to begin with Jamie Dimon, huh? So I guess um, I'll give a short summary and then we can go deeper. So basically, um, the reason I wanted to start writing about this is because I had some unexplored rabbit holes from the book I did that we've talked about. But I did mention in the book, right, that one of the people that was instrumental in choosing Jamie Dimon was this guy, big time Leslie Wexner crony, who had direct business links with Epstein named John W. Kessler. And so I mentioned that in volume two, that Kessler was played a major role. Oh, thanks. Uh, played a major role in getting uh, Diamond installed as the CEO of Bank One. And of course, as CEO of Bank One, which Diamond was appointed to in, you know, the t- in the year 2000, uh, gets folded into J.P. Morgan Chase in 2004, which is also the same year that J.P. Morgan buys Glenn Dubin's uh, hedge fund. Glenn Dubin, of course, being another close Epstein associate. Interesting. Um, but basically, uh, you know, after JP Morgan, but it, you know, acquires bank one and it merges into the great blob that is JP Morgan, uh, they decide that Jamie Dimon is going to lead the combined entity, right? So him getting installed at bank one puts him on the direct path to where he is today. Right. Mm. So who put him in charge of bank one and what was Jamie Dimon doing before? Well, what Jamie Dimon was doing before was creating what is now Citigroup with his mentor, Sanford Weil, Sandy Weil. And they're credited with being one of the, you know, major banking teams that developed the too big to fail model and had an outsized role, mainly Sandy Weil in, uh, you know, negotiating the repeal of Glass-Steagall because the Glass-Steagall Act prevented the consecration of Travelers Group, which was Sandy Weil and and Diamond's company, uh, with Citibank, right? And in order to create Citigroup, they had to get Glass-Steagall removed. This was 
the Graham Leach Bliley Act that broke these two up, correct? Which I think uh, actually happened under Larry Summers, right? And Larry mm-hmm. Summers, of course, a lot of Epstein ties that began before that act, you know, happened and before Glass Steagall was repealed. And at the time he was on, you know, hanging out with Epstein, probably in the 90s, his boss was Robert Rubin. Robert Rubin worked closely with Wilde to develop that policy that later became the repeal of Glass Steagall. And is and then after he stops being Clinton's Treasury Secretary, is offered a very cushy job at Citigroup. Uh oh. Anyway, before that, Robert Rubin was also the guy that signed off on Jeffrey Epstein's first visit to the Clinton White House. So there's a bunch of weird stuff going around there, you know, going on there anyway. Because right before then, right. Robert Rubin was head of Goldman Sachs and Goldman Sachs was intimately involved with Robert Maxwell's finances and his defrauding of pensioners uh, from the Daily Mirror and was facing court cases about all of that. And of course, Rubin would have been dealing with the fallout. And then the guy that's hanging around Ghislaine Maxwell and is sort of seen as this heir to Robert Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein, gets invited by Rubin to the Clinton White House and then gets involved with Clinton fundraisers. All very weird. So anyway, going back to Diamond, right? How did he and Sandy Weil start? Well, um, you know, they were, he Sandy Weil had, you know, he was at Bear Stearns, then he made his own firm. And then he, uh, get, he works for American Express. And then uh, that's where he first hires Diamond, who uh, he had been friendly with Diamond's parents after the company he owned acquired Shearson, which is where Diamond's parents worked. And um, he became at American Express executive assistant to Weil. And then Weil is forced out and Diamond is offered this choice of staying on at American Express or following Weil into the unknown, right? (laughs) And he chooses the latter. And so they look for a company to turn around and they pick this company called Commercial Credit Corporation. And when I was actually looking into the history of Diamond, that blew my mind because I like wrote a whole section about them and their parent company, Control Data Corporation, in my book, uh, because Control Data Corporation had all these weird ties to the Robert Maxwell network that are really disturbing. And uh, Commercial Credit Corporation was a company they acquired uh, that was also tied up with a lot of these same intelligence networks I write in the book. And we can talk about the specifics of that if you want um, at some point. But essentially, they pick this company that's tied up with all these weird intelligence networks to build what is now Citigroup. Commercial Credit Corporation is the vehicle that was used to create what is now Citigroup. That's mental. And I think it's important to remind the freaks listening right now that Robert Maxwell, father of Ghislaine Maxwell, of was, Ghislaine Maxwell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. was uh, a Mossad agent tasked essentially with propaganda. Yeah, and, and also had ties with the intelligence services of uh, the KGB, Bulgaria, which was you know part of the Soviet bloc at that time, um, allegedly British intelligence, and I mean, but mainly Israel, yeah. And so he was involved in a lot of things like the Promise Software scandal, Iran-Contra, which are really sister scandals, they're intimately related. And you have a lot of ties to, you know, th- through people involved in the Promise, you have weird ties to Wexner and the Limited, um, and of course, you know, Epstein pops up in some of this weird Iran Contra, um, you know, network and its activities. And we've, we've discussed that at length before. So um, no need, no need to repeat necessarily, but it's, it's pretty telling, I think that this is the company that they chose. And it was Sandy Weil that he, he claimed that he was approached by people at commercial credit corporation to take over that company, but there's all these different accounts of why which to me sort of suggests that they you know there's at least one party that doesn't want the actual story told you know who really knows anyway they go on this acquisition binge over time and you know acquire things like smith barney and solomon brothers and become this giant blob uh called the Travelers Group and, you know, already talked about what happened since then. But after several decades of being, you know, in Sandy Wiles' shadow, Jamie Dimon and him get into some sort of fight in like 1998 and Dimon is forced out. And then Dimon is in this position of, I don't know where I'm going to go now. I've lost my my job and I'm not working with Sandy Wiles anymore and I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, th- that's where Bank One comes in. So, um you know, if I'm looking at this from like maybe even a, a psychological angle, you know, what would they have offered Jamie Dimon uh, to have him be in charge of Bank One, right? Okay, uh, you want to outshine your mentor? Do this for us, right? 
Mm-hmm. You want to be you want to be the top of Wall Street above Sandy Weil and Citigroup? Team up with us. That's what I suspect probably actually happened. In in my last article, I talked specifically about who was on the search committee that chose Damie Dimon, and it's a bunch of insane white collar criminals and like CIA cutout people or people tied to Wexner that did it. So those are the people that would have made that sort of deal with Diamond. And it's really not that surprising, but ultimately, you know, the broader picture here, um, if you, if we continue to allow Jamie Diamond and JP Morgan and the, the people behind him to which he owes his current position, to take control of our entire banking system, you are giving control of all money essentially in the United States to uh, a, a, a con- you know a conglomerate of organized crime and insane intelligence agencies that want to enslave you. So um, this is very relevant considering today's events <laughs> as it relates to the banking crisis, um, because this series, which I'm hoping to continue, I really want to look at 2008, Epstein's personal role in the collapse of Bear Stearns um, and the role JP Morgan you know, played in acquiring that and some of the stuff before and after. A lot of the oddities there have not, in my opinion, been properly examined. And it sort of seems to me that a lot of these efforts that have helped further the too big to fail model, um, like the savings and loans crisis of the 80s, for example, um, and the 2008 financial crisis, um, intentionally created crises uh, to basically consolidate control over the financial sector. And I think that's what we're experiencing right now. Agreed. Uh, Now that you lay it out like that, it makes perfect sense. If you go back to Travelers Group, Citicorp, Graham Leach Bliley, which repealed Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall had a wall between the commercial banks and the insurance companies that allowed the mortgage-backed security market to completely explode between 2000 and 2007 to grow up, to get as big as it was, as systemic as it was. Exactly. So Bear Stern (laughs) fails into JP Morgan. And um, so you, you can see the order of operations here. Yeah. And like I said earlier, Epstein, Bear Stearns may not have collapsed if it wasn't for Jeffrey Epstein. That's insane in, the, in, in and of itself. Totally crazy story. But again, I, I prefer to talk about that once I have the, the article on it out. But if you, if you search for that, I mean, you can find inklings of, of what happened there. And it's very insane in the context of Epstein. What we know now about Epstein being this insane uh, white collar financial criminal that was very successful and involved in a lot of very shady financial dealings tied to intelligence. Um, and just like the savings and loans crisis of the 80s, um, which, you know, a lot of work has been done on that by people like Pete Bruton and others, it, it was pretty clearly the same deal. It was the CIA and a bunch of organized crime linked people and white collar criminals uh, coming together to basically empty out uh, and loot a bunch of savings and loans crises. And then the FDIC sells them off to a lot of these banks that later become the too big to fail banks like Bank One specifically the head of bank one in that particular point of time is also listed as one of the pioneers of the too big to fail model john b mccoy and uh, bank one acquired a bunch of these savings and loan stuff and some of these you know other you know controversial banks from that period that had different collapses and stuff so you know it it seems like if they're teamed up you know these big banks if they're teamed up with this particular network they get preferential treatment about who gets to uh buy these collapsed thrifts that seem to be collapsed by a mix of white color criminals in in the cia for pennies on the dollar yeah right and they're getting sloppy with it too like this year particularly in the aftermath of silicon valley bank <laughs> it's and signature so in your face now yeah. i just I mean, don't you had janet yellen come out and say you know what we're probably not going to backstop all the deposits outside of the systemically important financial institutions too big to fill which she decides in closed door meetings what those banks are exactly and it's it's i mean it's insane what we're seeing this week what we've seen the last couple months with all these regional bank failures is completely predictable if they're going to posture that way publicly like what are people companies with assets with deposits at these regional banks going to do when Janet Yellen's like, we're not going to backstop you and they're going to flood to the JP We're only going to back you if you're at JP Morgan or one of these other mega banks. Yeah. yeah. It's a Mental, cattle, and that's, that's a deliberate policy. 
It's a deliberate policy to herd everyone into the arms of these mega banks that are, you know, going to be the custodians of the CBDC wallet. How convenient. Yeah. And so what is the ultimate goal with the CBDC in your mind? Well, I think it's all, all right. So Christine Lagarde, right. Um, was pranked by these guys that somehow are able to convince a bunch of people that they're actually Zelensky. They got Jerome right? Powell, too. I don't too. know if you saw that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, they got her to basically admit CBDCs are about control, right? And then you have Augustine Carsons uh, saying essentially the same thing. Yeah. And, for, and he's head of the BIS, the yes. central bank of central banks. So you have the ECB and the BIS agreeing it's about control. I mean, I think it's pretty clear what's actually going on there. Yeah, Augustine uh, Carson came out with a, a clip, I believe it was two or three years ago now, but he essentially like CBDCs will give us complete control over the money. Who can spend, yeah. who has what money, where you can spend it. That's so what we're having are two parallel things going on. There's this push to digitalize everything. Yeah, to get all of the money, no more cash, it's all online. Yeah, the whole economy has to go online. Everyone has to go online for, for work and this and that. There's this push to make everything exist in the digital realm as part of the 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution and all this stuff, right? And at the same time, we are having, a, on, the, on the flip side, a concerted push by governments around the world to uh, completely control the digital realm. So the censorship stuff we were talking about earlier is part of that. But there's also these big efforts to end uh, financial anonymity, to end uh, just privacy online, have your gov your internet activity or your social media accounts tied to a government issued ID, right? Yeah. It's, so uh, if everything's online and you're, you're not allowed to participate in the economy unless you're online and that entire online environment is completely surveilled, including all your financial transactions, this is about an, a, an insane new surveillance paradigm. And I would say, too, keep in mind, this isn't just about surveilling, you know, what you do in the present moment or what you've done in the past. This is using all of that data from past and present, feeding it into AI and using it to predict if you'll engage in uh, naughty behavior in the Pre crime future. minority report it's here totally so mm. you don't even have to actually engage in anything the state says is bad anymore they'll be like this person might engage in something the state thinks is bad yeah and you see you see this light nudging <laughs> this creeping of this apparatus not only in the banking system but i flew out of newark airport a couple months ago and the new terminal that they just redid, I believe it was Terminal A or something like that, to get to security, you have to get a face scan. Like you can't, you literally can't walk through. Yeah, so TSA is going there now um, and are probably gonna make it so the only way you can get through TSA security is if you surrender your biometrics. So now it's like, oh yeah, you can only get in the fast lane if you do it. Like when, when I was in the States last year, I saw that at a few airports. So it's not at Newark. It's not even the fast lane. It's just to get into general security. You have to scan your face and then it has one of those opening doors and then you can go through the door and then you can go yeah. through security. So I've had to fly into Miami a couple of times in the past three years and they, they require a face scan too, just to get into the U S yeah. as, as part of the, you know, the whole deal. Yeah. So yeah, it's coming. It is. It's, I would argue it's really already here. A lot of it. Um, you know, I was just re uh, recently reading about how basically AI is in, in control of like most of the money right now be through BlackRock's Aladdin thing. Um, you know, that's mental. I wasn't yeah. really aware of that. So I'm going to have to study up on that before I can properly talk about it. But that's really crazy to consider when you consider how many assets, like how many trillion dollars in assets BlackRock manages. Well, and they've given like AI a bunch of control <laughs> over it. Like, well, that's I mean, right. you could argue, you could argue it's been around for a while, like high frequency trading. I mean, you could argue yeah, most, that most definitely, yeah. But as this AI stuff advances, you know, you had a guy, for example, Joshua Browder, the do not pay guy, who's all about like, yeah, AI lawyers for traffic tickets and stuff. He's like, yeah, so I gave Chat GPT complete control over my finances, and look how much money it saved me. Yeah. And going back to what our conversation idiot, with dude. Michael Krieger, like <laughs> what many people don't realize is that OpenAI founder, Sam Altman, he's also the founder of WorldCoin, where they're scanning people's yeah, irises uh, around the world. Yeah, 
Yeah, scan scan your give us your eye scan. We'll give you some free world coins. What a creepy dude! And then of course his partner in OpenAI is Elon Musk. Well, so. the, ju- the justification. <laughs> I was actually talking to somebody about it yesterday, and the justification uh, that this person I was speaking with believes will be rolled out is you need the biometric iris scan to prevent uh, bot spamming from the AI to literally be able to discern between when you're interacting with a human and an AI. And so they're saying to do that, you need yeah. this biometrics data to be secure. But yeah. This, this reminds me of this argument that Elon Musk makes where it's like, yeah, we all have to get a brain trip or we'll be enslaved by AI. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not really buying it. How about we just make a new internet or like <laughs> stop using it as much for everything? Agreed. Um, I don't think it's really, I need to, I don't really think I need to give these people uh, what my eyeballs look like. No. Considering what they want to use all this stuff for. Like, yeah. I'm not interested in feeding that system. But- well, I had a, a unlimited hangout contributor actually um, tell me to stop sending uh, when I pay them for articles to not pay the way I had before because they had to, in order to access their money at Santander, uh, they had to g- surrender biometric information what? to be able to access their own money at the account. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So they're really picking it up, right? And JP Morgan, right? has rolled out pilot stuff for face scans, face scan pay, uh, hand scan pay, which Amazon is also rolling out, right? But what happens when JP Morgan says, yeah, so now that uh, thanks to Janet Yellen and the current banking crisis, everyone in the country has basically put their money with us. We've decided to do away with credit cards, debit cards, and cash. And from now on, the only way you're going to be able to pay is with your face or with your palm. Yeah, it's... It's coming. This is what happens when you give these guys complete control. So, you know, if you're going to put your money with JP Morgan out of fear, that is the future you are building. Uh, Do not do what Janet says and take your money out of the too big to fail banks and find another way uh, to secure and and guard your wealth that doesn't involve these crazy people. Well, that's a very important. That's a very important thing to (laughs) highlight because that's one thing I think. Yeah, we've learned as a society in the aftermath of COVID, the economic lockdowns, the uh, vaccine mandates is they use fear and they create this false frame totally from which you have to operate. And now they're doing it with the banking system. It's like if you don't go here, you're going to lose all your money. Um, and they're trying to box you into this frame that they're putting forth. But it's not the, the only option that you have. Obviously, we have Bitcoin um, in other ways mm-hmm. of securing your sovereignty, what you talk a lot about buying land, growing your own food, becoming as sovereign as possible. And that's one thing that I think you're yeah. doing a really good job of. And we just need to keep beating this drum is like, do not reject their frame. Do not fall into Do not do what Janet says. It's yes. that simple. Do not do what Larry Fink says. Do not do what Jamie Dimon says. All of these people are insane. And it's not a good policy if you want to live a happy life and, and be free to listen to insane people and do what they say. I'm just, you know, no, I, I, I mean, feel like that's common sense. But. Well, it's literally <laughs> the definition of insanity because these people have been telling us they have the solution for decades now. And they've only led us to the situation where things seem to be worse than they've ever been before. Yeah. And, and people that claim this is just incompetence, uh, that's not true. That's not true. This is not incompetence. And the incompetence excuse they've gotten away with so much. Oh, well, we just screwed up. You know, I'm sure when everything gets really crazy, Jerome Powell will just be like, oh, I'm a dummy, you know, and not be like, yo, yeah, I actually, I, I you know, we kind of collude with the big banks that own us. Right. Well, um, and that's one thing I think you highlight that makes it very hard to argue that it is incompetence and not some form of malice is how s- relatively yeah. small the circle of influence is it to is get small. these people in these positions to roll out this plan. Yeah, most definitely. It is a small circle. Like, so, you know, like I said, the reason I, um, part of the reason I was writing about the rise of Jamie Dimon is because I, you know, I had this, this known Wexner link to him being selected to the to head bank one uh and because of the jp morgan epstein case that's going on right now right from the u.s virgin islands that's being uh you know heard in new york um i was like well maybe i can find something when i look into this you know weird wexner epstein guy that was involved uh, in installing diamond in that position as you know what became 
you know, the head of J- how he became the head of JP Morgan Chase, basically. And dude, you know, I mean, I talked a little bit about it, you know, earlier, but I mean, it's even crazier than that. Cause I didn't even get into like bank one and Wexner, um, or some of these other guys there, but I mean, it, it, it's a pretty small circle. And um, a lot of these powerful individuals, well, you have Wexner on the one side, but one of the most instrumental families, aside from the Wexner clique that got Jamie Dimon installed is uh, the family I talk about in, in part two of the series that's up right now, uh, the Crown family. And James Shine Crown is uh, the guy that was the most vocal advocate for getting him on. And Lester Crown, James Shine Crown's father, is basically responsible for Obama's presidency and his Senate career and basically him being like a big guy, right? And of course, it was Obama whose cabinet was chosen essentially by bankers at Citigroup and, um, you know, the Wall Street banks during the Occupy protests, right? That chose his cabinet for him, mm-hmm. right? And, and all that Crazy chaos. stuff going on. And all mm-hmm. that chaos, they're totally. using the fear and the propaganda to essentially have the populace beg for that, um, that sanity, yeah. that control. Mm-hmm. So here's the other thing about James Shine Crown. Still today, he's on the board of J.P. Morgan still after he, he was on Bank One, right? And then had Diamond put in at Bank One with these Wexner guys. And then... Um, uh, after JP Morgan takes over bank one goes on from bank one to JP Morgan to be on the board of the combined entity, along with Kessler, the Wexner Epstein guy. Um, and, uh, since then he's been the chairman of the risk policy committee at JP Morgan. How interesting. So, you know, the risk policy committee, right. Are going to be the people who develop the policies that prevent, you know, crime from happening at the bank. Right or things that shouldn't happen from happening at the bank, preventing the bank from engaging in illegal activities, things like that. And he's been called to resign multiple times for things like the London whale fiasco, Mm -hmm. because apparently he sort of allowed that to happen, which is odd. Right. And then of course you have JP Morgan's role in in things like creating the 2008 crisis and all of this other stuff. And what we know now also allowing Epstein to operate there, even though top executives at JP Morgan joked about his interest in underage girls and he was sending nudie pics to people at the bank and, you know, uh, not of himself of girls uh, and, you know, talking to a top banker there, just Stally about, what Disney princess he'd like to meet next and all of this stuff. Yeah. James shine crown, huh? Uh, some great risk policies he's developing. I wonder why he's still there. Oh wait, you know, maybe it's by design that this guy's there because when you look into his family, I mean, they basically uh, run Chicago along with the Pritzker family and Thomas Pritzker has been subpoenaed as part of the JP Morgan Epstein case. Interesting. Along with the head, uh, the co-founder of Google, Sergey Brin, and uh, Mort Zuckerman, a top real estate guy in New York and a big figure in the Israel lobby. And uh, Mike Ovitz, who used to be a president of Walt Disney. Yeah. Hmm. And that's, I mean, going back to this J.P. Morgan case around Epstein and the Virgin Islands, another important thing to highlight here is that the AG who brought this case forward got immediately fired. She did. Yeah. Um, by the mm-hmm. Biden for administration. Well, what, the and Biden they're administration made a, made a phone call. That's, yeah. mm-hmm. It should be pretty clear to people that this case is, has a very different flavor than anything that SDNY did when they went after Epstein himself or Ghislaine Maxwell. They're subpoenaing billionaires that had like are important people as part of an investigation and court case about Jeffrey F. Epstein's sex trafficking activity. Yeah. And so that's another thing like, yeah. to bring up now, like while all this is very Orwellian, it's very scary. It's very daunting. It does seem like things are unraveling a bit. Like we had, was it New York times, the wall street journal, like calling out names, like wall street, Cho- wall street journal, calling out like Noam Chomsky and other, this former CIA director uh, that met with Epstein. And it seems like there's like a crack in the, the, the solidity of this cabal or group where things are leaking out or is this like a limited hangout where they give us some information, we'll hang yeah. some people and then just keep going their merry way. So I think the wall street journal thing is probably a limited hangout. They claim to have a trove of documents, thousands of pages, not just of the private calendar, right. And schedules, but emails, they haven't public released any of it. They haven't said who gave it to them. 
right? So there's a lot of question marks about that, in my opinion. And I think, um, uh, so there's two pieces from the Wall Street Journal about these documents. The newest one came out today, and it's all names that we've already heard tied to Epstein. Larry Summers, uh, Woody Allen, Reed Hoffman, Glenn Dubin, Bill Gates, right? You know, these aren't really new names uh, for people that have followed the Epstein case. Now, the one that came out on Sunday that had like Chomsky, for example, had some names that were uh, new, like William Burns, former CIA director, former head of the Carnegie Endowment, former deputy secretary of state under Obama, um, which is apparently when those meetings were taking place when he worked at the State Department, which is interesting. Uh, it, it, because I talk about in my book how Epstein had this weird tie to the State Department in the early 90s. And then there's this weird controversy, uh, and I, I didn't end up including it in my book because there was some questionable stuff about it, but it was circulated for a long time, this idea that um, a State Department plane and a plane Epstein owned shared a tail number. Um, and that was in like the late 90s, very odd to say the very least, but you know, again, uh, there was some questionable stuff there. So, you know, I, I didn't include it in my book, but the early stuff in the 90s definitely is true. He was given, uh, the right to occupy residences that had been seized by the state department. Like one of them was a former Iranian, like Iranian consulate and he was renting it out. And, you know, uh, it, I mean, just totally weird. And apparently had some weird relationship with the secretary of state under Bush senior, uh, James Baker. So I don't know. And then he's meeting with a top guy at the state department later on. And then of course the current secretary of state, you know, his, the guy that raised him is Samuel Pisar, who was Robert Maxwell's best friend and the uh, confidant and lawyer. So uh, it seems like the state department loves to hang out with these guys. Uh, it's not really that surprising because, you know, Hillary Clinton was in charge of it for a while and she obviously moves in these circles. Yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely some weird stuff, um, you know, going on there. And uh, then you had, you know, mentions of uh, a guy that is a top guy at Kissinger's consultancy firm, which is interesting. You have the mention of Noam Chomsky. Um, again, interesting. But, you know, I wouldn't paint. I, I just wrote an article that came out yesterday about the Chomsky and Epstein revelations. And it's not, you know, I wouldn't say Chomsky was necessarily an Epstein crony. And what I argue in the in the, in the piece is, is more that, you know, if you look at the arc of uh, Chomsky's career, he's made a lot of compromises over time. And I think by the time he got a lot older, he made a lot more of those kinds of compromises. So the first one I cite, right, is that, you know, he in his early career took a lot of military funding, Chomsky. And then he became an, an anti-war activist. And as part of that, considered resigning from MIT, which is like a very intimately tied to the military industrial complex, very intimately tied, probably more than any other university in the country. Right. And so he decided to stay there because it gave him a platform to espouse that activism. And that's an understandable compromise. You want a platform so it, you're, you know, it reaches more people and, and whatever. OK, so, you know, I'm not going to crucify you for that. But it seems like those types of compromises he continued to make and a lot more of them once he was a bit older and potentially less radical. I don't know. Because how else would you justify meeting with someone like Jeffrey Epstein and Woody Allen <laughs> and stuff? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. uh, the reason Epstein wanted to talk to Chomsky, by the way, was all about artificial intelligence. And uh, Epstein had openly talked about this in an interview he gave in 2017, uh, which the Wall Street Journal did not include. So... Um, just more indications that they left out a lot of information that could have given important context, including about like Ehud Barak example, another name that comes up in this Wall Street Journal stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they declined to mention that he spent the night at the apartments owned by Epstein's brother where all these traffic girls were housed and was seen there super frequently all of the time when he was visiting New York. Yeah. That's not Epstein's residence. That's where the traffic girls were housed. Yeah, and this is the former <laughs> prime of minister of Israel. For, of Israel. For, well, he's not just a former prime minister of Israel. He's also former head of Israeli military intelligence and a former defense minister of Israel as well. So, uh, And he was head of Israeli military intelligence during the Iran-Contra affair. <laughs> and when well, Robert Maxwell was doing the promise software stuff for Israeli military intelligence. Um, yeah, so, I mean... Ehud Barak probably met him before 2003, as he claims. Um, just like, you know, Bill Gates claimed that he met Epstein in 2011 as bunk. It's hard to believe what these people say 
about the relationship with Epstein when there's, you know, indicators that seem to point to an earlier meeting. Right. So, well, that's, I think that's a smoking gun in all of this too, particularly with like the wall street journal revelations that all these very powerful people, you can give them the benefit of the doubt if they did meet Jeffrey Epstein early on in their lives and or early in the 2000s, late 90s, whatever, before he was convicted for these crimes. But anybody who met him after yeah. 2013 when he was released from prison and knew what he was involved in, that's like a smoking gun. It's like, hey, you knew he was sex trafficking, yet you were courting him and meeting with him many times throughout yeah. the years. Yeah, well, that's like the thing that really bothers me about like, not just the revelations about the Chomsky meetings, but what Chomsky said about it. He was like, well, first of all, he goes, it's none of your business or anyone's. And then he's like, oh, and I met him and uh, I knew him and met him occasionally. It's a weird response. Instead of similar being to like, Bill Gates. Oh, like... no, it's even it was even more like rude, I guess you would say than than bill gates who had like a spokesman being like oh well we met for dinner and this and that he wasn't like it's none of your business i mean that that's a weird response person. well i'm i'm thinking of uh, the interview bill gates did like last year the year before where he was pressed oh on he's it dead on TV. And it's he's fine. dead now it's fine like you can wash your hands he's dead yeah well chomsky what the thing that i i wanted to mention is that he said oh well i met with him because he served his time and in per u.s norms and laws that yields a clean slate and that to say that means you're completely ignorant of the whole scandal that broke in 2019 about the sweetheart deal with Barr. Barr yeah. was included in this, right? Well, so the sweetheart deal was before William Barr was attorney general. Barr was involved was attorney general when Epstein died and was arrested the second time. But okay. the sweetheart deal, right? The time served that Chomsky's referring to there is for his his first arrest in sentencing, which was around 0708, right? And um, as part of that, there was this sweetheart deal that was arranged. And for people that remember a few years back, Alex Acosta, who was secretary of labor under Trump, arranged that when he was U.S. attorney in Miami. That's what it yeah? was, Acosta. And he Apart. said he signed off on that because he was told to back off of Epstein because Epstein belonged to intelligence. So somehow Chomsky is completely ignorant of that. And I don't really know how that's possible because all the scandal that came out with the Miami Herald reporting and Julie Brown and all of that was all about the sweetheart deal and how Epstein didn't really have time served. <laughs> right. And then um, his, his lawyer was that Harvard professor. What's his name? Um, Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz. One of them. He had several defense lawyers who helped orchestrate the sweetheart deal. And right before he was due to be sentenced, Epstein went to tour military bases in Israel. How bizarre is that? Um, definitely what someone awaiting sentencing for sex trafficking would go do. I'm going to go to Israel and tour military bases um, before my sentencing hearing. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go check in Bizarre. with my, my bosses at Mossad, and uh, I'll be back in a few years. <laughs> eh, but he came back right away, and it was probably because he was very sure that there was going to be some sort of lenient sentence, and there was. Otherwise, yeah. I'm sure he would have stayed abroad, right? Yeah, yeah. It's also over, yeah. not in the open. You think? So you? But Chomsky's ignorant of that. By the way, one of his meetings was with was with Epstein and Ehud Barak. So. Yeah. And Woody Allen, when he was pressed on the Woody Allen stuff, he was like, hey, I had a great dinner with a great artist. He's a great artist. Yeah. yeah. Not a guy that uh, abuses uh, kids uh, of, you know, the adopted daughters of his uh, girlfriend and then marries one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's also disgusting. Are you yeah, totally are you optimistic that people are waking up to this? Oh, man. I mean. I think, again, the mainstream media stuff on Epstein is like super managed to divert people, uh, you know, on a path that is completely meaningless. So, again, like, you know, it's this sort of like Bill Gates narrative. Well, Epstein's dead uh, and people are like, oh, well, I only met with him because he had money and all this stuff. Like, no, no, dude. <laughs> well, that, again, a lot of like, you didn't meet with him because of that. But at the same time, an in independent media, just because you met with Epstein doesn't mean you're a pedo either. Right. Because this is a guy that was an, a big time, like white collar, financial criminal, shadow banking guy. So, you know, he he had many hats. So, again, mainstream media being like um, Epstein was only a sex trafficker. I don't think is fair 
right? And then uh, that, of course, helps protect all the stuff like the JP Morgan stuff I talk about in my series, right? All those connections and why, you know, JP Morgan might have allowed Epstein to use their bank for all of these purposes while I openly knew about it. And, you know, they're trying to protect the system, right? And trying to make him the scapegoat for everything bad now that he's dead. Yeah. You know? No, and if you think about it, like the sex trafficking was only a, one of the tools in his belt where they used it for blackmail. Totally. And then you had the power yeah. broken going on in the financial system as well, which maybe yeah. some people got yeah. caught up in the sex trafficking and the pedo shit, but not everybody. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems uh, when it comes to just talking about the Epstein scandal. But for me, I, you know, I think the Epstein scandal is important because it has large public interest and helps lead people. If you look at it, on a deeper level, like I try and do in my research and in my books, it, it helps you see how power really functions in the United States and beyond. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what the discussion really needs to be about at the end of the day. So, you know, uh, and even the fact that like Epstein was murdered and everyone knows it. I, I mean, it's just a meme, right? Epstein didn't kill himself. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, as a society, what, what we did with the fact that this guy was openly like oft in prison, even Alan Dershowitz doesn't think Epstein killed himself without help. Right. I mean, I mean, <laughs> literally um, you can use physics to prove that the bed sheet that he apparently hung himself with would not have killed him. Like he would have ripped that. It, yeah. I mean, I know it's just, Anyway, what we did with that obvious thing is that we turned it into a meme and that was it, right? Um, and honestly, when I look at US poli like politics and like media discourse today, I feel like if Joe Biden like crapped himself on stage, slapped a baby or did like the most insane crap in the world, no one would like bat an eye anymore. Like even people that hate him, it would just be like memed and then like nothing would happen. Well, that's and I think... But isn't that true? I mean, think about it. Like, do a thought experiment uh, and be like, what would happen if, if Joe Biden did that stuff? Well, I've got And that's like the president of the United States, dude. And I've got a I've got a personal Joe Biden story for you. I was home in Philly a couple months ago. Oh, wow. My family went <laughs> to uh, a nice French restaurant in the city to go to brunch. And we sat down and Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, the whole family shows up to the restaurant. It was very odd. Because you'd think President of the United States shows up to one of the busiest restaurants in Philadelphia. He'd go around, shake hands, kiss babies, like give a little like tour, media tour to show that yeah. he's one of the people. They just went, sat down, ate, and left. Like they didn't even, like I think it was because Run away. <laughs> his handlers knew Maybe. that like he, he's not competent enough or he's supposed to be aren't running. There. He's supposed to say he's going to be running in 2024, but the DNC is like, yeah, we're not doing primary debates. Does yeah. no one realize how insane that is? It's completely insane. Well, that, and that's the other thing. Yeah, like, but I mean, it doesn't even, shouldn't that be a huge talking point on mainstream media? The DNC is not going to have any debates and the yeah. uh, the Republicans are going to have like 12 and the, G, yeah. the DNC is going to have zero. Yeah, everybody's just like, hey, let's not talk about that. And but it's like, it's fine. That's all I'm saying. The, the dude could like slap a baby in the face or like try and curb stomp a baby and like nothing would happen. They'd just be like, oh, Uncle Joe. Well, do you yeah, think and that'd be that? <laughs> do you think they're playing two games here, though? They're like they have two <clears throat> options. One is like, all right, we're going to try and force Joe through. But if his health is deteriorating at an increasing pace, we need a backup plan. So did you see the FBI whistleblower that came out yesterday? Oh, yeah, about the pay the to play bribery scheme. thing with the yeah. foreign national. Yeah, but the Clintons are all about play to play. The DNC is is, is the play to play part. Well, not that Republicans don't do it. I mean, they all do it. Right. But the DNC with the Clintons are just like everyone knew that was happening, especially with the Clinton Foundation. Like it's proven, you know, yeah. and nothing happened. So you don't so. think anything will come from this whistleblower? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think it'll just be a Fox News talking point, right? And they'll be like, you know, it, it's it's like what happened during the Obama administration. Fox News is screaming about Obama and everything he did. And then like everyone else doesn't care, you know, and they're just like, oh, that's Fox. Yeah. And then when it's the other way around, it's like, oh, my God, Trump, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just this retarded media dialect. I hate it so much. I do as well. Um, because it, 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 it's, it's just keeping uh, anything productive from ever happening. And uh, the American people are being completely looted and, and pillaged and having their standard of living destroyed. And, uh, you know, we're arguing about, you know, stuff that doesn't matter. It's, uh, I mean, I get really frustrated about this stuff because, you know, uh, just even in my work, I'm like, shouldn't people 
care more about some of this stuff. And not just even my work, but the work of other people that like showcases a lot of the crazy stuff going on with people at the top. Well, you know, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm too optimistic. Maybe I'm too much of an eternal optimist, but I do think independent journalists like yourself are making a material impact. And I do think. Well, I hope so. Right. Yeah. And I do think what happened last week with Tucker was like a big awakening moment for a lot of people. Like, holy shit, it took Tucker off. Like what else is going on? And I do think like the Tyabees, the Greenwalds, yourself are beginning to garner more attention and more, um, more authority in terms of like journalists that, that are out there that people are actually reading and listening to. Well, I think, you know, mainstream media is shit and everyone knows it at this point. Well, at least most people know it. And so, you know, they're looking for other places to find information. And I mean, that's positive. The question is like, you know, are people just going to binge watch videos all day or are they going to start actually doing something about it in their lives? You know? Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what it's going to have to, you know, end up coming down to if people are going to, you know, uh, make any difficult choices. Because like I've said a lot of times, I think people have become so accustomed uh, to comfort and not really having to do anything in terms of like politics, because we, we've been trained as a society to outsource everything to other people, right? To corporations, to the government, whatever. And so, you know, that's why we have this sovereignty crisis, right? Because people have been trained or society has been created so that we don't really have to take personal responsibility for most of our lives and our needs. Yeah. You know, and so we have to make that change. And again, I think the most important way to show people to make that change is that you should not be validating the current system at all. Instead, you should be divesting from it and putting your money and time into building a new system. So if you're going to vote in 2024, uh, I see it as, you know, you're essentially validating that system, yeah, right? Well, because they're not going to let RFK Jr. get the win the DNC nomination. And, you know, I, whoever the, gets installed as a Republican guy, maybe they'll be better than Joe Biden is, but by how much, right? Can we really afford to keep going down this hole we're going down to like, you know, insane tyrannical fuck land like i'm just no because it you know if all the independent media discourse between now and the 2024 election is about who to vote for we're screwed that's how i feel and and we'll be squandering a lot of this awareness i completely uh, agree that's happening around people yeah that's that's why we need to highlight things like bitcoin (laughs) the sovereignty movement supporting your local ranchers local farmers figuring out how to grow a garden but on that point completely agree like that's what people need to wake up and realize we're less than a month away from the debt ceiling. The government is essentially insolvent is literally insolvent. It's been insolvent, but now it's retardedly insolvent. Yeah. And (laughs) And they can't kick the can down the road anymore. And that's where the CBDC comes in. Yeah. And that's, that'll be a bait and switch. That's what people need to internalize. There literally is no way to vote your way out of this insolvency. It is structurally insolvent. There's no saving it from within. You need to create these parallel systems. Yeah, because essentially, um, you know, through the petrodollar system, the dollar is a global reserve currency, which it's about to lose. That has sort of uh, granted the American public with a sort of subsidy and insulation from the actual cost of things to an extent. Right. That's going away. Yeah. Um, And then you have this. Yeah. And then you have this banking crisis stuff on the other side and all, you know, the debt issue, you know. Is money print? Are, are we about to see helicopter money <laughs> with the debts? I mean, how how insane is this going to get? It's obviously not a pretty picture, and people really need to start seriously thinking about what this means because shit's getting real. And the people that have led us here are creating a new system so they don't have pitchforks at their door in a year's time. Well, I think that's a very important thing to highlight too: is the people who have led us here are petrified. They may, may not. Uh, show that publicly of Jerome Powell, Jamie Dimon, Janet Yellen, Joe Biden coming out. Well, the they last can't week. show publicly, right? Yes, they have yes. to be like, it's it, not 08. Everything's fine. It's literally a confidence <laughs> game. And so for anybody out there yeah. listening who uh, thinks the government can solve this problem, you need to realize that they are petrified. They've realized they've screwed up the system beyond repair and they are not the ones to fix it. Like you need to engender a sense of self-confidence that you have the facilities, the intellect, the ability to make a decision to opt out of that system. And I think that's 
one thing I actually had a conversation this morning. That's the most high leverage thing we can do as independent journalists, as individuals that see what's coming is really wake up that silent majority that has that feeling in their gut that something is terribly wrong. Um, historically, they've depended on the government to fix the problem. Obviously, it's led us to the situation. They're not going to be able to fix the problem. They're only going to make it worse. Like getting to that silent majority that knows something's wrong and saying, hey, there are other options. You don't need to depend on daddy state to fix this for you. In fact, they're only going to make no, it worse. No, definitely don't depend on the state because the way it's being set up is that you will be a slave forever. If you follow the state and look, are waiting for a handout from the state when things go belly up, they'll be like, okay, join our new slavery club. You'll never escape and neither will your children. Okay. I mean, if you're willing to sign off on that, I mean, they've already enslaved you before mm. they've even rolled out their system. You know, no, but, if you're but, not willing to lift a finger to actually do something about it, you know, they, they've, they've got you yeah. already. But it really does feel like, and I know people have tried to call it many times in the past, but I do think I do have this gut feeling, this instinctual feeling that we have gotten to the point in the path where we're at the fork and we're, we're about to make the turn one way or the other. And it is, this is one of the most important times in human history It's like, which way are we going to go? And that decision is going to be made in the next year or two. Or right. Right. Because this isn't just an economic crisis, right? Um, like I said earlier, um, these guys have really bitten off more than they can chew. They're trying to do so much. They're not trying to just change the economy. They're trying to redefine what money is. I mean, that's really what the CBDC is all about. Um, they're trying to usher in this thing they call the fourth industrial revolution, which they define as a merging of our physical and biological cells with technology. It's transhumanism, right? And people that are futurists and transhumanists and, you know, on for this stuff essentially say this is about changing humanity. And as humanity as we know it will be gone in 100 to 200 years. So this is like really an existential crisis if there ever was one, because if we successfully are herded into the system, we're creating a uh, human sovereignty and humanity as we've understood it since humans have been around, it will cease to exist. Are, are we really going to co-sign that? Like, I just don't understand. Like, are people really that lazy Whether they're like, yeah, okay, well, you know, I mean, uh, Netflix and beer, it, as long as I have that, it's cool. I mean, are we, are we really just going to be stuck in that where they do this stuff to everybody? Whitney, you're such kids? a, you're such a Luddite, you know, Dude, we need the chips. Yeah, it's our evolution. You're just scared of, <laughs> of technological evolution here. Okay? Yeah. Well, they call it evolution, right? But trans transhumanism is the new eugenics and it's explicitly so. Well, the former head of the British Eugenics Society came up with the term transhumanism and said this will be the new eugenics. And 10 years before that, when he was in charge of UNESCO at the UN, he said, we have to make the unthinkable thinkable again with respect to eugenics. And he did that by coming up with this concept of transhumanism. And this is where you yeah. have like people like Yuval Harari going out there and being the front men to like uh, get people comfortable with this yeah. and pitch all of it. But it's uh harari's insane if you actually read what he writes about this stuff and he's talking about making a new religion around ai which is also stuff not just he's saying eric schmidt and henry kissinger who have teamed up to create the ultimate doom squad are also going around saying the same crap yeah it's either going to cause a revolution or ai will make a new religion what do you think they want to choose guys uh, well i mean I don't know how you think about this, but I think it's like overtly satanic, like demonic. Like there, there is like, so, it's literally an, uh, an aversion to God. Like we are the gods. Now we're going to transmute humans into this new technology. Like we can do it. It's very, if you're a Christian or Catholic, like myself is very, it's a, it's a very big affront to God. Well, even if you look at it from a more like, um, you know, I guess non, theistic view mm -hmm. it, it, these people are very materialist right and so you know traditionally people view satanism as extreme materialism when you get into like actual the study of of like religion itself right you know it's materialism in in against spiritualism right uh, and so like hedonism the most material the most material you can be right is is a lot by some people at least sort of equated with 
Satanism, right? So, you know, basically, if you're going to create an AI and say it's a god now and make, you know, uh, it, it, I, I can see why people view it that way. It's, it's, let me go back to stuff Harari likes to say about this AI religion. He calls it dataism, or at least he has in the past. And it's, it's like saying, it's basically this idea of like, we need to put sensors on every living thing, whether they like it or not, because we have to create this new like connectivity between all things. Okay. So if you're not an atheist or an extreme materialist, uh, even like indigenous religions from thousands of years ago, pre-Christian paganism, those connections exist already. Right. So they're just trying to make an artificial hyper materialistic version of that that they can create for themselves and ultimately they can control so this is you know people trying to play god and if you know if, if you want to go back to the the satanist you know analogy the whole idea of lucifer right is him trying to be bigger than god yeah. at the end of the day so you know for christians i can see why they see it that way right so at you know but a lot of people get turned off when like you use that term you know and so that, that's why I'm trying to sort of explain in these other terms, maybe that are helpful to sort of understand what a lot of these views are and why people might use those terms for it. Because if, you know, if you have that other understanding, it doesn't seem as, you know, as weird to some people that, that aren't, you know, religious. Right. So yeah, I, I mainly say that because, you know, think about stuff going on in the eighties, the Franklin scandal broke, which is a real thing, but people sort of claimed, Oh, it's satanic panic you know? Mm -hmm. And so when people to a certain segment of the American population, when someone says Satanism, they just turn off their brain. You yeah. know what I mean? No, I completely... So essentially what you have. Yeah. So, you know, to try and reach those people, you know, I tend to try and phrase it in, in sort of different words that this is an effort to create basically in divorce humanity from the spirituality that humans have had during during christianity pre-christianity any religion really even animism and stuff you know to divorce us from any sort of connection not just to um each other in the universe but to the natural world as well right um and to basically recreate humanity in a way that serves them i guess at the end of the day and and so much that is happening right now is about divorcing us from the natural world you know um, having us live in this digital realm and then going even deeper and living in the metaverse and all of this stuff. Yeah. Right. Neck down, um, looking at your phone, swiping the reels. That's what they want. Yeah. So I, you know, I think a big part of, uh, the system today is the smartphone and smartphone addiction and it's, it's impact on society. And I think if people can't imagine living without their smartphone, I think it's going to be very easy for people like that to be herded into this system Yeah, because they control the smartphone. I mean, even if you have like Graphene OS or a de-Googled Android, which is definitely, you know, the only feasible thing, I think, you know, uh, to avoid using a big tech smartphone, which I definitely would consider people or urge people uh, not to use, but this, you know, it, the telecommunications companies, Verizon, AT&T, all of that, I mean, they're all part of this thing. So like, you won't have internet access, you won't have data. Can you live without that? A lot of people can't, no. you know, it's literally addictive. a lot of people can't even live without like Twitter and TikTok and whatever. So, yeah, you know, uh, fire. Fire hydrant. Oh, fire okay. Truck I didn't know. I thought for a second. Well, we had an earthquake here last night. So oh. I was like, oh, maybe that's on my end and something insane's happening. Yeah, it was like at one in the morning. It was only like four on the Richter scale, but it was like right near where I live. So it was, did it wake uh, you up? Uh, yeah, a little bit. The kids didn't wake up. So that was helpful, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, in a sense. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Maybe yeah. I've gone on some tangents here, but ultimately I think, um, you know, if you've become so invested in their technology that you can't imagine living without it, that technology, that addiction is what's being used to help herd you into this system. Right. And again, you know, to get us in there, if you imagine it sort of as like an animal pen, a corral, right. Uh, how they have two tools to get us in there. They have the carrot and they have the stick right? And the carrot is comfort and convenience. 
And so, so much of this new stuff coming out right now, particularly in healthcare, that's either overtly or covertly transhumanist, it's, it's convenience is almost always the sales pitch. Right. Yeah. And I think that will be two of the brain machine interface, you know, like, think oh, it. you'll just have your smartphone in your head now. How convenient. Yeah. Right. Or and even like face pay and paying with your palm, like JP Morgan's rolling out. How convenient. You don't have to carry a wallet anymore. No one can steal your money off of you when, you know, there's muggings will stop. <laughs> right. And then, you know, the stick is fear. So I think that's pretty clear. You know, yeah. do this or uh, you'll lose all your money. Do this or we'll put you in camps, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's and, another theory out there too, digging into themes in the U.S. particularly right now that has sort of, I, I sort of see how it could be real, which is that like this whole transgender movement and theme in the U S is, is a bit of a nudging towards the transhumanists because first they have to essentially destroy definitions of things that we know to be true, to create the possibility for us to be open to becoming transhumanists. First it starts with like, ah, I could be a woman or a man or a zero or, or whatever. Um, and then it's like, yeah, I can be a computer. It's like somewhat of a normalization tactic to, to lead us toward that. Well, you know, the way it's, it's, it's promoted and you know, there are people who were transgender before it was being yes. promoted and popularized. Right. So Agreed. I'm talking specifically about the people that if this effort to promote it and popularize it had never manifested would probably not have identified as transgender. I think there's a, one of the reasons it's happening is because like you say, there's a, this effort to sort of uh, make people disassociate from their physical reality. Like so they're disassociated from their physical body. They don't identify with their physical body, right? And so if you don't identify with your physical body, you know, from that point, and probably part of why this is being targeted at, at young people, um, it's much easier to be like, well, in this world, you can be whoever you want to be and you can change yourself all the time like the metaverse stuff right yeah. and there was even like an american idol during the covid there was like this american idol equivalent show and it wasn't it, it was basically people not performing themselves they'd sing and do a mic but not in front of people what would perform in front of people was an avatar that they designed a virtual them that expresses their true self because they you know for whatever reason didn't like how they looked or something yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think there's an, a different efforts on a societal level to manipulate and use certain things uh, in, in certain um, insecurities or, or dysphorias that have been around, you know, long before now uh, to push people in, into this, you know, world that they're hoping to create at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're using social media to get these messages <clears throat> out there and people are addicted to it. And that's the other weird thing when it comes to like smartphones and social media. Yeah. Like the data is out there. It gets very obviously affecting the mental health of young people, particularly more specifically young girls. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. I was reading this interesting article in unheard that was sort of talking about the anorexia phenomena in the nineties and its similarities to uh, the prominence of transgenderism in, in the past 10 years, uh, how it being sort of dis disproportionate among like teenage biological females um, and sort of the, it, it, I would definitely recommend people read it because it, it definitely did have some insights that I thought were kind of interesting in terms of like why this might be pushed and why it might have been so successful. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a major effort to uh, totally destroy today's young people. And it really shouldn't be surprising um, when you consider, you know, all the revelations, right, about just how messed up Hollywood is, um, you know, the elite circles are and how they control our media, our education system and all sorts of stuff. So over time, you know, they're obviously going all those things are going to have an, a major impact on young people. Yeah. And I think the smartphone is a big part of that because you're allowing kids to sort of access uh, these worlds and their parents have no idea what's going on there and what's happening and don't know. Right. Yeah. What was it? The game Roblox people. It's like a popular children's game. And 
they thought they were playing with other kids, but they were really playing with adults who were grooming them and parents are Gross. completely unaware. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, that's part of it, but you know, even a- away from games like that, I'll just give an example. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, my ex had an older son who, uh, when we lived together, uh, he was probably like eight or nine. And at his school, there were kids with their own phones. This is here in Chile, right? Um, and they were just at recess, just looking at like really intense, sadistic porn. Ugh. And so, like, you think about when we were kids and, like, guys, you know, that age are like, ooh, I want to look at boobies. And they pick up, like, Maxim or Playboy and they, like, hide it under their mattress and stuff, right? Yeah. So these kids with no, like, you know, parental, no need to hide anything because it's all on a phone and they can access more of it than ever, right? Super fast and basically constantly stimulate themselves with this content that they, you know, in previous eras didn't have access to. Yeah. And especially at that age when the brain's still forming, like what kind of long lasting effects does that have? And then when you. Yeah. And it's going to impact how they view intimacy later on in life, how they view relationships, how they view women. And there's a flip side to that, too, you know, with how all these all all this type of technology affects women and girls. Um, So, again, you know, I think a lot of people. uh, Well, here, let me circle this back to stuff we were talking about earlier. Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, is subpoenaed as part of a major sex trafficking investigation into Jeffrey Epstein and J.P. Morgan Chase. No one's talked about that. Google what, controls YouTube, uh, controls search, uh, controls the Android operating system on smartphones. Um, okay. That's nuts. Why is there no coverage of that? But there is coverage of, uh, you know, Noam Chomsky um, and uh, some of these other names that have come out that are newer. And I'm not sure if you caught Um, this story a few years ago, but going back to like Android, Google, Android team, there was like the higher ups at the Android team were running like a sex slave operation that became public. Wow. No, I didn't know that, but I can't really say I'm surprised. And then at the same time, Google is pushing for a lot of this transhumanist stuff too. You have people like Ray Kurzweil, who in the metaverse wants to be a promiscuous woman named like Rosie or something, by the way. Um, <laughs> go look it up. That. It's real. Yeah, that. go look it up. It's real. Um, yeah, you know, are, are the people sort of that have planned a lot of Google's future tra- uh, trajectory. And then you have Regina Dugan, who used to be in charge of Google's advanced projects team and also the top, the, the equivalent of that at Facebook, and has now been tapped by the Wellcome Trust, sort of the British equivalent of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to basically create transhumanist toddlers. Yeah. And no one cares at uh, Welcome Leap. She's a former director of DARPA, by the way. It's a very small circle. Very small circle. <laughs> it's creepy. Well, again, DARPA. And uh, the military have been a longstanding driver of uh, artificial intelligence research going back to its inception, you know, in the 50s and 60s and stuff. And what do they want it for? Oh, and then again, another one of these guys that's been subpoenaed along with Sergey Brin that's not getting any coverage is this guy named Mike Orvitz, who's a former president of the Walt Disney Company, right? And when he was president of Walt Disney... Um, the guy in charge of the Imagineering department was this guy named Brand Farron. And at the same time he was uh, in that role at Disney, Brand Farron um, was also advising military and intelligence in the United States. He was like on the Army Science Board, involved with a lot of really weird stuff. And he brought to the Imagineering department Danny Hillis and Marvin Minsky, who uh, before that had run this uh, supercomputer firm uh, super closely tied to DARPA called Thinking Machines that wanted to create an artificial general intelligence. And uh, at that point, Minsky and Hillis were very tied up with Epstein. Yeah. They have Google. What are all these guys doing there at Disney? Right. And like, these are like you mentioned with Google, particularly YouTube, Android search own that Disney, obviously the most popular uh, media company focused on children's entertainment. Like what, what are they seeding yeah. through these avenues? Um, and I mean, think about yeah. the people that run these Hollywood studios. Like um, this morning, uh, it, there was this clip circulating by this child actor, Matthew Lawrence. And he was saying, 
Yeah, so my agency fired me because my agency sent me to the hotel room of a prominent Oscar winning director who asked me to take my clothes off so he could take Polaroids off of me and told me to do X, Y, and Z, presumably sexual activities. And if he did so, he'd be the next Marvel superhero. I saw that clip. Extremely creepy. Yeah. And he said not to he said he didn't do it. And then his agency fired him. <laughs> okay. So now I'm really wondering about all these actors that are uh, Marvel superheroes now. <laughs> well one of them's great. Like wasn't that Ezra Klein guy? Like literally didn't he murder somebody or something like that up in new york or? oh did he uh, i don't know i don't i've never even seen a single avenger movie so but i don't know that's the other thing Sorry. like for all these uh defectors in hollywood uh, i saw that clip too i wish you would have named the name like why can't they well the he might be concerned and yeah. i i probably wouldn't blame him um yeah but keep in mind too all those marvel movies have major contracts with the military like iron man i mean this is all uh you yeah, know i mean there was yeah, it's public like record propaganda against China and stuff like that, or well, not just that, but like the, the, there's there's like contracts signed between the Marvel movies and um, the military. I would argue that's how Elon Musk got all those cameos in Iron Man and why they modeled Tony Stark after him because he was a military contractor at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, this is how we make people think that Elon Musk is a real life superhero. So when he takes over Twitter and makes a brain chip, people will be like, yeehaw. He's, yeah, he's Tony Stark. I love that guy. <laughs> you think the Marvel movies are a form of propaganda to light nudge people to like normalize the weaponry? Yeah, I, I would suspect so. I, I'm I, I haven't really paid attention to their plot lines and stuff, but um, why would the military be so interested in having contracts so that they could unduly influence the direction of those films and what's showcased and the plot lines and all of that? Yeah. <sighs> It's also yeah. creepy. Again, I'm optimistic, though. I think we're going to win. I think people are getting fed up, particularly with the bag. Well, I think people are getting fed up. And I do. I, I mean, I think I think we are going to win, too. Again, And I've said this a few times. What concerns me is how much damage do the, these these guys do in the interim before they're stopped. Yeah. I mean, they're and literally... that question is really how much damage do we let them do? Yeah. Before we stop them. So yeah. We adopt Bitcoin. Get this number to go up. And you'll be surprised that uh, the power you'll be able to wield against this system. That's what I truly yeah, believe. But, well, so I'll be at the Bitcoin conference in a couple weeks. You will be there as well. And I'm going to be giving a talk. And one of my talks is going to be about the WEF partnership against cybercrime, which includes the FBI and Department of Justice and uh, Bank of America, a lot of the big banks. And how in their policy papers, by the way, the partnership itself is run by a, a career spy. That's enheartening, isn't it? Um, it? Their policy papers say that not just is using Bitcoin as currency a threat and driver of cybercrime, but Bitcoin having value is a driver of cybercrime. These guys want to drive the value of Bitcoin to zero. Oh, yeah. And that's the FBI and DOJ. Yeah. <laughs> They certainly do. That's mental. Yeah. I think people should start paying attention to this stuff. I do as well. Especially, you know, Bitcoiners, because it's not just like, oh, Gary Gensler and this and that and the regula regulations coming and all that. People like, you know, that are the people backing Elizabeth Warren and stuff in these efforts want the value of, of BTC to hit zero or yeah. near zero. No, we talked about it on your podcast with Michael, but the attack particularly on Silvergate and Signature with their SEN and Signet uh, protocols allowed the, the Bitcoin exchanges to, to send money between each other over the weekend, 24-7, 365, um, was an overt attack on, attack on the industry. And I've talked to many people mm -hmm. who are very intimately connected with what's going on behind the scenes with the banking situation with Bitcoin companies. And it is an overt attack where they're trying to cut us at the knees via the u.s dollar on yeah. frames mm -hmm. yeah just gotta try and outsmart them i guess um but again you know just gotta have a realistic view of of what they plan to do right yeah. so you can try and be one step ahead at and the I know, end of the day you know and i know we've talked about this before but it's extremely important to make fun of these people ridicule them <laughs> it's not hard though i mean they're not exactly I mean, like it, we're, that's the other thing about like 
2023 with the internet and communications, a double-edged sword can be extremely addicting and can lead you down a wrong path, but it all, could also be used as a tool to ridicule these despots and me out meme them basically like prove how hypocritical and insane they are. Yeah. Yeah. The but technology. at the same time, a lot of the mean lords fall for people like Elon Musk and stuff, you know, and yeah. that's kind of disheartening uh, to me because, you know, for people that were like, oh, free speech, Twitter, uh, it's come out now that he is approving more government takedown requests than pre Elon Musk Twitter. So, yeah, and it's another like, limited did you think hangout. the military contractor was going to do anything besides that? Yeah. Uh, I didn't. It's almost like a li another limited hangout too, where they're putting like the disclaimer, like they fact checked it biden yesterday with like some uh about uh u.s added defaulting on its debt. yeah adding context yeah. it's like these little drips of yeah we're, we're free speech and then like you mentioned behind the scenes like eh, well actually we will abide with these these government mandates yeah you know i mean a lot of these guys have like you know a public persona and then privately they do other stuff and i mean most of these guys are like that yeah i think at least you know, like Peter Thiel, right? One day he says he's a Bitcoin maxi and speaks at the Bitcoin conference. And then he's on stage with, you know, CIA to Mike Pompeo saying it's a financial weapon from China. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't sound like a Bitcoin maximalist to me. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a, they're very good at creating alternative narratives and confusing people. And that's, again, another thing yeah. that we've been beating the drum on for many episodes not only on this show but your show is people have to develop the confidence to believe in themselves and not feel forced to yeah. look up to the peter teals of the world the joe biden's of the world the jenny ellen's jerome powell's jamie diamonds to tell them what to do you have well people like to look for saviors you know what yeah. i mean and no one wants to save themselves no. right so like that's going on with this Noam Chomsky stuff, like a bunch of people like Noam Chomsky for certain people on the left became like a dim eye God, right? Like a, a can do no wrong figure. And he's definitely very different now in his later years than he was in his younger years. I mean, why else talk. would he have been like send, send the unvaccinated to camps? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. So if you're an anti-imperialist and you know anarchist and you're going to advocate sending one side of a polarized debate the side you don't agree with to camps okay well, you're you're not an anarchist anymore <laughs> um and that doesn't sound like you know the stuff that people thinks he stand for but i mean that was fine but you know yeah. the epstein meetings the response to that is all a bit weird and again this is not saying like oh chomsky uh is all bad whatever i mean i personally uh, dislike him for various reasons including his gatekeeping on the role of the fed and creating financial crises for example um on jfk on 9 11 and also on epstein's ties to intelligence which he said were a conspiracy theory before these recent revelations so uh-oh um that's interesting that, the, that these revelations have sort of maybe he had a reason for not wanting to pursue that. I don't know. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought, well, but basically Chomsky um oh, sorry. I was just going to say, bring back the anti-war free, free speech, absolutist Chomsky. Like if you just stuck with that. Yeah, that'd be thing. nice. But again, we shouldn't be deifying these public figures because when these guys get like really big you know and they're mm -hmm. tied up with all these guys and you know they're at this these establishment centers or they're you know military and intelligence contractors like thiel and musk da, 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 da. you should not be deifying people um in general and, and i think it's part of this problem that is like very culturally uh, entrenched, not just in the United States, but a lot of other countries where we look for political saviors. Oh, we just need to find the right leader who will lead us out of this mess. And this one guy will fix everything. That's Trump's not, that's a, Trump's not Trump's a perfect it. example. Like. Totally. But I mean, there's examples all over the place and throughout history and people just desperate for, you know, if only we could get this guy in the white house and yeah. stuff, you know, anyone they hear on YouTube or wherever, like say something that's really true. They'll be like name of that person, 2024, you know, in the comments, like this isn't, th that's not how this, this should be working. Right. So many people are so desperate to just not have to do any work to get out of this, you know? Yeah. 
It's uh, I'm going to give that guy a thumbs up and I'm going to share his thing and I'm going to click a couple times and I've done what I needed to do. Nobody's going to save you. No, you can only save yourself. <laughs> no. Exactly. And that was the American ethos for like a couple centuries. And we got away from that. And uh, I think we should get back to that. Yeah. We need to get back to it, people. Well, I think the work that you're doing is helping us get back to that. I think. Oh, well, thanks. I'm happy that I'm going to see you in person in a couple of weeks in Miami. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not so, not, 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 I'm from Florida. I'm not really into Florida, but I'll, I'll go for Bitcoin magazine and to hang out with people like you yeah. uh, and talk to people about some stuff um, that I think is important, you know, but, uh, woof, Miami. I'm not, big, I, I'm not a big fan of Miami <laughs> either. I uh, love the conference. Uh, not a big fan of the city. Yeah. It's actually pretty, kind of in the same boat then. It's pretty emblematic of the, uh, the materialist culture that uh, we've been opining on this whole yeah. episode. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, this has been great. Uh, thank you again for the work you're doing, for sticking the needle in the eye of these people. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I like to do, or at least feel like I'm doing. I make my best attempt at doing that. That's actually how I think of it in my head. I'm like, well, if you're going to try and destroy everything around me, I might as well try and stick you. Yeah. <laughs> you know and i must mention the site the design upgrades have been incredible your site is one of the most aesthetically pleasing uh independent journal oh, sites out there i and appreciate that if you need help if your readers are getting uh asked to provide biometric data to their banks to pay you Ooh. we have we have the bitcoin paywall if you want to implement on your site because you use that's this too. true we mm -hmm. can get you hooked up with that oh, you, can cool. tell them you don't have to uh you don't have to give Santander your uh, your eyeball scan. You can uh, pay in Bitcoin. And... Yeah, no. Well, I don't paywall stuff, but I do have people that donate to the site. And so my work is entirely supported by like small donors that donate through the website. Oh, and you have a BTC so, space server set up. So. And, and I have that. So I'd probably just keep that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not into paywalling stuff. I mean, I, I monetize my podcast a little bit, but I always release it. Yeah, I take down the paywall after like three days, and that's the only thing I paywall. Yeah. Not really into paywalling. So. That's, uh, I'm about to go write a newsletter that's paywalled. I'm experimenting with it too. See what's the better model. <laughs> no, I mean, it's fine. It just depends on you, right? I just, um, you know, I want as many people to read my stuff as, as possible. So yeah. that's sort of, you know, if there's a paywall, you're going to get less eyes on it. And I yeah. care more about that than I care about, you know, raking it in personally. Yeah. No. So. But no, I agree. I, that's my model, and I write different stuff than you write, you know? So no, no, I agree. I've been experimenting with it, like, for eight months now, and I do think I like that model better. Um, or just, like, give it out. Hey, it, everyone emotions. has different, you know, not everyone's, like, you know, projects in, in journalism are the same, you know? So yeah, if it works for you, it works for you. Yeah. What uh, What should we leave the freaks with? Um, man, well, <clears throat> I wish I had something more coherent and awesome to say, but getting woken up in the middle of the night by an earthquake may have broken my brain a little bit today. But, um, you know, basically, I think the most important thing, and uh, we've talked about it many times, it's time to get uh, out of the armchair and into the real world and off the screen and start building something. Um, you know, I guess I... You know, people like you and me, Marty, and, and other people that talk about the stuff, we're sort of like, you know, to use, I guess, a biblical example everyone knows, right? Noah's Ark, right? Noah tried to tell everyone the flood was coming. People were like, you were crazy, right? So even if you're like listening to Noah, right, and the people that are telling you the flood is coming, uh, you got to do something about it, right? And I'm not saying get on my ark, right? I'm saying build your own ark. I like that. And have your community build an ark, and get on it yeah like we said yeah only you can save yourself shit's gonna get real yeah but it doesn't have to be just you right team up with your best friend team up with a group of families that you know and trust and build something yeah exit and build now is the time now is the time and it's never been easier to do it with the technology we have with the uh, <clears throat> information we can share 
It's uh, now is really the time to do it before they pull the plug on the internet and demand a digital ID to get on it, and it's super censored. I mean, the internet once they pull the plug on the internet like that, it, it's not going to be the same. The internet is now just letting people know, like, don't, don't give up your freedom to access that thing because it's going to be the most sanitized internet around. Because there's no anonymity anymore, so you can't shit post, you can't like meme, you can't talk shit. So all that stuff will be gone, right? Yeah. And it'll basically just be all chat GPT generated websites anyway. So what's the point? That sounds terrible. I don't I don't want to participate yeah. in that internet. No, I don't either. So it's time to build something new. And that doesn't mean you have to like build something new the Luddite way, right? It, it's different for everyone. Yeah. I've we've got a um chat offline about Noster. I'm not sure if that's been on your radar, but that's a promise. It has, but yeah, I I have not had enough time to really check it out. But it is definitely something I would I would like to get into because as far as you know, I'd really I can't wait until I've been waiting until Twitter censors me, and I'm just like, why has it not happened yet? <laughs> you know, because I'm I I like rarely use it anymore. I hate social media. I yeah. can't stand it. So, um, and honestly, I think so much of it's fake. I mean, if you consider all this chat GPT stuff and the same parent company, you know, Elon Musk and Elon Musk owns Twitter, like how many bots are on there now, dude? I mean, we don't know. There was never any visibility into that, but we know Twitter, even before Musk bought it, had a major bot problem. And the military has poured millions of dollars and per the air force trying to use social media to control people like drones yeah so i mean it, it's a total psyop playland for these guys and that's why i think using other platforms it is important and you know nostr seems really promising because it's not like some of these other platforms that try and be just like twitter but not yeah. twitter well, the beauty you know? of it is it's not a platform at all. It's a protocol. And you yeah, can build it's a protocol. And right. It in. So, um, right. So I think that's definitely more promising and I'd like to get into it. But again, I, uh, I'm really short on time because I'm trying to like, you know, make content for why I'm in Miami and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sort of doubling my workload and I have tiny people who take up a lot of time as tiny people tend to do. Take up a lot of time. Um, yeah, they do. Hey, but they're fun. It's, it's um, good time. It's good time. I'm happy they take it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, and exactly. Noster's, Noster's a little clunky right now too, so it's probably not the best time to, uh, mm, to jump in. But I'm sure, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, it, it came out not that long ago, right? So, you know, a lot of this stuff takes time to, you know, fix itself, even yeah. itself out. It's happening though. Um, all right, I can't mm -hmm. wait to see you in Miami. Yeah, super, see you soon, Marty. All right, that's all we got today, Freaks. Peace and love. The key.